Well, good evening, everybody. Hopefully you can hear me. I know it's crowded. There's some seats in the back. Um, hopefully we have uh, a nice attendance watching online as well. Thank you for making time to be here. I want to welcome you to the Husky Theater. I want to thank the Husky staff and student body for letting us occupy this space today. And also thanks to everybody who helped put this event together. Luis Samora, who's handling our uh, production of the live stream in the back. And my name is C.J. Kamek. It's my distinct honor and pleasure to serve as the superintendent of Fremont Unified. And we're here tonight to talk about school funding in Fremont Unified. We're going to be going over a number of different things. Some of it may be review. Some of it may be complex information that you haven't seen before. Some of it may be a little bit mysterious because that's what happens when we talk about school funding in the state of California. Nonetheless, Hopefully you'll leave today with a better understanding of how we receive our funding, how we allocate our resources, and how the mechanism of school funding works across the state. As I mentioned, we'll be going through these topics. We'll really talk about the school finance and the challenges as the bulk of the work that we discussed this evening. Also want to begin by recognizing our Board of Education. We thank uh, Trustee Jones for being here this evening. Our board president, Vivek Prasad, vice president, trustee Yajing Zhang, clerk, trustee Larry Sweeney, and trustee Sharon Coco. Also very proud of our student board member representative who offers a wonderful voice to our governance team. We have our cabinet team, um, myself. This is my fourth year as superintendent in Fremont, my eighth year as a superintendent in the Bay Area. And we are also joined by Assistant Superintendent Salinas this evening, who brings with her a wealth of expertise from local districts and from San Francisco Unified as well. She and I are both embarking on our fourth year together as we started in August of 2020. Quite a unique time. And we're also joined by our Associate Superintendent, Mr. Daniel Hillman, who happens to be a Fremont alum from American High School. And Mr. Larson's unable to join us today. He's also a Fremont alum, second generation staff member. Uh, for Fremont Unified. When we talk about Fremont Unified, we obviously are going to be talking about our students and our staff. And as you can see from the screen, from our student population, we're just over 32,600 students. You can see a breakdown on the bottom right of the screen between the percentage that are socioeconomically disadvantaged, our English language learners, special education, foster youth, and those students without permanent housing. On my left hand side of the screen, your right, you can see the number of staff members that we employ. And 60% of those staff members are teachers, 36% are support staff, and 4% of our district team is management. Across the district, uh, you can get a picture of how we are divided or united in our schooling. We have 29 elementary schools, 5 middle schools five comprehensive high schools, our continuation school and alternative independent study school, one adult school, we have two early learning centers. We're also very proud of our two dual immersion schools, Spanish and, Immer and Mandarin, as well as our elementary science magnet school and our arts magnet high school. Last year, we had six schools recognized at the elementary level as distinguished schools. And if you're not familiar with that recognition program, it switches off between elementary and secondary each year. In 2021, John F. Kennedy was highlighted as a distinguished school, and Robertson High School is a model school, model continuation school for the state of California. It's also the only continuation high school in the nation that's recognized as a model professional learning community school by Solution Tree. So why does this matter? Why are we talking about school funding now, and why does it incorporate students, staff, and the community? Well, I think it's important to note that funding for schools really operates in a unique fashion, and that is that we are provided funding based on our enrollment, but we only get a percentage of that funding based on the number of students who attend school regularly. We refer to that as our ADA, our average daily attendance. So even though we staff and design everything for our total enrollment, the state of California only provides school districts money based on a percentage of the students that are there regularly. So for Fremont Unified, that's around 94%. Traditionally, pre-pandemic, it's been up towards the 97, 98%. Both of those numbers are relatively high within state comparisons. Everybody's average daily attendance has taken a dip post-pandemic, anywhere from three to six points. 
And so we're still within that range, but our average daily attendance is relatively high compared to other districts. And so what we look at is how we receive that funding and the myriad of expenses that we face as a district to operate all the programs, services, and facilities that we operate. And we're not like private sector businesses where we can adjust the profit margin, adjust the price of our product. We really are in a fixed state where we, re we rely strictly on the revenue from the state of California, the federal government, or our local community. And so because of that, we are at the mercy of many mandates, most of which are unfunded or underfunded, and we'll be talking a little bit about those this evening. And so we get revenue from the state, and when we get increased revenue, that comes in what we call the local control funding formula, the LCFF, and that comes to us via the COLA, and COLA is something you may be very familiar with hearing, the cost of living adjustment. Well, we think of the cost of living adjustment, I think in general terms, as something that individuals see as how much the increased costs are for goods and services that we might purchase. Well, we get a COLA as a school district, but that COLA is really just the increasing amount of LCFF. It's not a separate fund that comes to us just for increased goods and services. So when the school district gets a COLA, we have to utilize that increased revenue, which is generally our only ongoing increased revenue year over year, to handle all of the increased costs for goods and services that we as an agency purchase. And we also need to allocate that money to our employees in a fashion that helps recognize their dedicated service and assist with our recruitment and retention of employees. So it's very difficult to take the new revenue from the state, which is really what it is, under the title COLA and pay for both of those pots of, of competing interests at the same time. So where we're gonna ground this discussion tonight is the framework of focus that's in draft form that the district is working on. And you'll see the bottom part of the graph is sound fiscal management. And when we look at the goals around sound fiscal management, you'll see, and I'm not gonna read them all to you, but you can see the goals that we have as, as a district that we are working very hard to accomplish. And these aren't one year goals. These are ongoing habits and practices that honor the work of our staff and our students and our community with the expenditure of limited resources very carefully and making sure that the expenditure of our fiscal capital and our human capital are aligned with the things that we want to accomplish within the district. So I'm going to turn it to our Associate Superintendent, Mr. Hillman, who's going to begin going through some of the mechanics of school finance, and then I'm going to come back in a little bit and talk about some of the challenges that face Fremont Unified related to school finance. Good evening. Thank you, Superintendent Cam. So in order to understand school finance, we have to start with where do school districts get their revenues from? And they primarily come from three different places. The state, the federal, and local funds. On the state side, there's about a little more than a thousand school districts in California, and the majority of them, the vast majority of them, get the majority of their funds from state revenues. So that could either come through the local control funding formula, which we're gonna talk more about in a second, or it could come from other types of state funds, restricted grants, and things of that nature. Typically, state funding represents about 75 to 90 percent of the funds that a K-12 school, a public K-12 school, will receive. Uh, federal funds, approximately 5 percent of Fremont Unified's revenues come from the federal government, far less than most people think. I think that if you talk to people who aren't involved in education in California, they assume that the feds are involved in, at a higher level, and they really aren't. Um, locally, local funding makes up a very small share of Fremont Unified revenues even after factoring in local decisions by Fremont voters like the parcel tax measure I and also school site donations. So the allocation of money in schools in California is pretty complicated. Until the 1970s, ballot initiatives and court decisions reaffirmed that school funding was really a local issue and it was something for the governor and legislature to not get involved with. Local property taxes were the primary funding source for local school districts. A small portion of districts were supplemented by state and federal funding, but that structure was later ruled unconstitutional because property taxes varied all across the state, and that created large differences 
among California school districts. In 1978, Proposition 13 reduced the amount of local property tax revenues being collected, thereby shifting the primary funding for schools to the state level. The amount of money available in schools from the state budget each year is determined by a formula in the state constitution, Prop 98. So between 1978 and 1988, there was lots of discrepancies in how schools were funded. It was still inadequate. It was still not fair. And so Proposition 98 was intended to try to balance those things out. Approximately 40% of the general fund, that's the state's general fund, is committed to K-14 education each year. Number three here, the state sets the per funding level using something called the local control funding formula. And we're going to get into the mechanics of this in just a minute, but this came along in 2013. Again, the state recognizing that Prop 98 wasn't perfect, they tried to amend it. They tried to make it a little bit better. Student enrollment and attendance rates are very important factors when determining a district's revenue, as Superintendent Kamnick was mentioning a few minutes ago. Everyone always asks, well, what about local property taxes? Don't those still matter? They absolutely do, and we're going to show you how they do in just a second. But their importance has been diminished since Proposition 13 was passed in 1978. The state collects other taxes, too, and then distributes them to districts as necessary, and it depends on what kind of district you are. It also depends on what kinds of students and how many students you have, and we'll get to that in just a second also. So let's talk state revenues. There's something called the big three, and that's personal income tax, sales tax, and corporate, corporate tax. 95% of California's general fund revenue comes from these three sources. There are other little things they do, like DMV fees and things like that, but this is pretty much where the majority comes from. Um, personal income tax, I want to touch on that for just a second. In the 23-24 budget, it's estimated that $126.7 billion in tax collections are going to come from personal income tax. That's 75% of the state revenues a year ago. So if you think about it, of the big three, the biggest of the big three is personal income tax. And what's included in personal income tax is capital gains tax. So the taxes that people pay on their investments. So we've got it up here for you that 1% of Californians contribute 50% of all the personal income tax collected in the state. That's a pretty staggering statistic. Sales tax, there's the projection there, again, for this current year, 39, a uh, little over $39 billion in estimate, and then uh, corporation tax, tax $33 billion for the current year. So how does Proposition 98 work? Well. As I mentioned earlier, it was passed by voters in 1988, and Proposition 98 determines school funding as a portion of the state budget. It's a guaranteed minimum level of funding for public schools that at least keeps pace with the growth of K-12 student population and the personal income of California residents. I'm not gonna get into the, the super weeds on this tonight, but I can tell you that there's three different tests that the state uses when trying to figure out what the minimum guarantee should be each year. And the legislature and the governor get to make some decisions about that. They follow the three constitutional tests, but what if state revenues come in short that year? Well, with a two-thirds majority vote of the legislature, they can vote to not fund the minimum guarantee if they want to. They can also provide more money if they want to than the minimum. They did do that recently in 2022 when they uh, gave some additional money towards local control funding formula. But you may remember in the Great Recession, they did suspend the minimum guarantee and gave schools less. So at the end of the day, the legislature and the governor have complete control over this thing, even if it's written into the state constitution. There's always a way out for them to not have to pay the bill in the moment if there isn't enough tax revenue to do it. So that's, in their mind, great flexibility, and it makes it really difficult on schools to budget appropriately when you don't know exactly what's coming from year to year. Uh, Proposition 98 dollars, as we mentioned in the previous slide, primarily coming from state funds through income, sales, and corporations tax, capital gains tax, and gets combined with local property tax. I promise that's coming in just a second. We'll show you how. And as I mentioned earlier, about 40% of the state's general fund is allocated to K-14 education. So here's how this works. Here's the property tax piece. So under local control funding formula, they set the level, and we're going to show you what the levels are in just a second for each individual student and each individual district. But what happens first is they fill the bucket that goes to the district with the local property taxes that are collected at the county first. That's the green on the left there. 
Then they take any additional state taxes that are necessary and they fill the rest of the bucket. And that gets you basically the LCF funding level there. So when the beaker gets full or the bucket gets full, that's the target and they give that money to the district. Well, in Fremont in 2223, approximately 49% or 182 million of the FUSD LCFF funding came from local property taxes. That's the green. And then the state topped it off with another 187 million because that was what they owed us. That's what the formula said they owed us. So they filled it with property tax first, then they filled it with state funds. What happens if you happen to live in a community where the property taxes exceed what the state says you should get? Well, in that situation, you get to keep the balance. So this graphic is showing you that the property taxes get you all the way to the funding level and anything that's left over, the district gets to keep and they can spend it on obviously whatever their plans call for. So this is probably one of the best visuals I've ever seen to try to explain this difference. This is called a community funded district and one of the best community funded district examples is probably Palo Alto Unified. Their property taxes are, are pretty high, the assessed values are pretty high, they get to keep any of the extra money and they can put it right back into their schools. They don't rely on the state nearly as much as their neighbors. So we've talked about local control funding formula. We want to break this down for you and tell you a little bit more about it. So there's two key drivers of a district's LCFF allocation. The first is base grants. And as Superintendent Kamek mentioned, that's based off of average daily attendance. Then there's two other types of grants called a supplemental and a concentration grant. And where this comes from was with Prop 13, Prop 98, there had never been the state's ability to address really effectively the needs of high need students. What this is trying to do is address those needs. And so we have something called the unduplicated pupil percentage, UPP. And this is now an important factor in the way a district gets funded since 2013. Included in this pupil percentage are the number of students enrolled who are English learners, eligible for the free and reduced uh, meal program and or foster youth, but you don't count the student twice. So if they happen to be an English learner and they're also a foster youth, you're not counting that student twice, you count them once. That's why it's called unduplicated. We love acronyms, so we say UPP, and it's a little hard to spit out unduplicated pupil percentage every single time you want to talk about it, but this is an important factor and here's why. When you get to the way things are funded, this green bar here talks about the number of dollars that every student at each of the grade levels gets, no matter what district you're in, this is what you get. So if you're a TK student all the way up to grade three, the school district can assume you're going to get $10,951. You'll see the little footnote. This is inclusive of something called class size reduction. You may have heard of that. That's baked into this number. You can see that the other grade spans dollars are listed, and I'll just highlight the high school one, nine to 12, because there's also an add on there for the legislature and the governor recognizing that career technical education, things like auto shop, wood shop, things of that nature, are more expensive to run. So they add in a little bit of money there too. That same footnote for the TK students. So this green bar is where we start. So if you've got 30,000 students spread around TK to 12 grades, these are the dollars you're gonna receive. The yellow and the blue come into play with the UPP. So if you have any students who qualify and are considered in that percentage, the school district is going to get an additional $2,188 for every student that's in that grade span, TK to three. So they're getting the base plus the add-on. And the intent of that supplemental dollar is to address the student's needs by doing more for them. It isn't supposed to replace what they're getting in the base. Every student gets the base. The supplemental is supposed to be an add-on to help them. Some districts, have more than 55% UPP percentage, they get the blue bar. And you notice the way I phrase that, you can probably determine that we don't have that many students that, that qualify. So you'll see in a second how it all calculates. So here's a comparison. Fremont Unified with our base of $342 million, supplemental grants of 19, a little over $19 million, and zero concentration grants. Again, because our UP percentage is about 28%. If you compare us to a similarly sized district of about 30,000 students, this is a real district. I will remain nameless on who that is, but 
you can see here it's 78% UPP. They have more students with higher needs. They get additional dollars in the supplemental grants and they get additional dollars in the concentration grants because they're above 55%. So a similarly sized district, 30 to 33,000 students, you can see what Fremont Unified is getting and you can see what this other district is getting. Now, you would argue that LCFF is doing its job because this district is demonstrating that it has students with higher needs and the state has responded by providing additional dollars to meet those needs. That's the premise of the local control funding formula. So what does LCF, LCFF pay for? Um, as we mentioned, with face dollars, the core components of district operations, it includes but is not limited to classroom teachers, clerical and administrative support, custodial, maintenance, and other operational support, along with related supplies and services, generally funded by the base funding in our general fund, which we'll talk about the general fund in just a second. Additionally, supplemental funds. These funds are key in our local control accountability plan called the LCAP. The costs are related to personnel, services, materials, and operations above and beyond our core services. That's the way it's intended to be structured. What is not a part of LCFF? Special education funding is not a part of LCFF. FUSD receives restricted state funding, which does help us fund our special education programs, but it is not enough money to cover the actual cost of the program. So where does that money come from? It comes out of our general fund, and that means we have to always balance the needs of all the programs and all of our students on a continual basis, and this is just one of the things we have to do. This is what we do every day. The other thing that's not included in LCFF is any specific facilities funding. So when we talk about needing to put money into our facilities, that can only come from one of two places really, and that's going to be any sort of decisions that a local community makes via a general obligation bond. Fremont has a history of doing that in, in a successful way with Measure E. And then there could be a state bond, sometimes you'll hear about that, the legislature wanting to put a state bond on the ballot for voters to say yes or no to. That makes facilities funding available, but oftentimes, it's not first come, first served. It's given to the districts that need it the most. And so there's a demonstrated need, then those schools might get a leg up on the application process. So one of the things that we wanted to make sure that you walked away with tonight is a little bit of an understanding about how districts account for the dollars that we receive on an annual basis. So one of the things that we wanted to describe is funds. And this isn't, uh, well, I'll just get into it. So now that we've discussed a little bit about revenues and how they're calculated, one of the things I wanted to introduce you to is to something called the standardized account code structure known as SAS. This is in the accounting weeds, and I won't go there for very, I'm just gonna dip my toe for a second, we're gonna move to the next slide. But one of the first things in that long account code string is called the fund number. And we, I wanna review that with you because I want the public to understand the differences between our general fund and some of the other funds that we track. So school districts use funds to separate the various financial transactions so that it's easier to ensure compliance with and reporting the laws and regulations that govern schools. Currently, Fremont Unified is managing 14 different funds. So let me show you what those are. There'll be a quiz later, and you need to understand. <laughs> Just kidding, we won't do that. I do want to point out three funds in particular. Fund one is our general fund. This is where we do the majority of our operations. This is where the majority of our salaries are, where the majority of our revenues go. This is pretty much the accounting books for the majority of the district. There's lots of other things on here with very specific purposes, but I'd like to point out the Special Reserve Fund 17. This is where Fremont Unified keeps its state required reserves of 2% and the 1% reserve that the Board of Education has deemed as an extra reserve. So we keep a total of 3% of our expenditures. All of that lives in the ending fund balance in Fund 17. Also, Fund 21 is an important fund. It's our building fund, and that's where the local bond sales go so that we can modernize and work on our schools. That's Measure E. So those are probably the biggest balances that we have, and I wanted to point those out because those are the ones that get a lot of traffic. There are some others on here, too, that are very busy, but we don't have time to really get into them tonight, but they're just as equally important. So the general fund is essentially split into two different categories, unrestricted and restricted. And these are the actual dollar amounts from our current budget, $482 million in revenues. On the unrestricted side, we talked about LCFF. 
389, almost 390 million of that comes from LCFF. 16.6 million is coming from non-LCFF sources, including parcel tax and the lottery. On the restricted side, there's about $78 million. Of that, it's broken down into federal funding, 9.6. And of that 9.6, 6.4 is for special education. And then we get some additional funds for Title I, II, and III, and career technical education, about two and a half million more. And then there's some additional state monies. You remember at the very beginning when I started speaking, there's extra state monies that come too outside of LCFF. Well, here's some of them right here. The state does provide some funding for special education for Fremont Unified. And this year we're expecting about 27 million. There's also $2 million in lottery funds and then an additional 34.8 in block grants. These two block grants, the 34.8, are one-time block grants. So they were given to districts and allocated last year. We have about seven years to spend them down. And once they're gone, they're not gonna be replenished. Also, I'd like to point out that you see lottery on here twice, on the unrestricted side and the restricted side. That's not a typo. We do receive some funds from lottery that are unrestricted that we can spend on, on a vast majority of things. We receive some lottery funds that are restricted and can only spend on some things. So in order to stay in compliance with state law, we have to split the funds up and the expenses up on the two different sides of the house, unrestricted and restricted. Unrestricted, you can spend it on pretty much anything the board wants. Restricted has very limited specific purposes and you can only spend it on those things, otherwise you're in violation of state rules. So here's just a different look at the revenues. You can see that the vast majority is coming from LCFF. It's a good little picture. As we mentioned, federal revenues are 9.6. State revenues, 73 million. Local revenues, 9.7. Still totaling up the 482 million. On the expenditure side, these categories and the way it's broken out is, again, goes back to that accounting structure. We don't get to pick. This is so that every school district does it the same way. So our certificated salaries, basically any of the, the salaries we pay to employees that hold a credential, whether they're an administrator or not, fall into certificated salaries. That's our teachers, our counselors, our speech therapists, all of the people that hold credentials are there. Our classified salaries are basically any of our employees without a credential. So they could be your paraeducators, it could be bus drivers, it could be classified managers. Employee benefits, 103 million there. And if you subtotal those three things, it's about $415 million. So what we want to point out here is that salaries and benefits are totaling 82 to 83% of our total expenditures. We spend the vast majority of our money on our people. We're a people business, that makes sense. We're aligning our spending with our values. That's not a bad thing. It's just worth pointing out. So that if the state needs to change the revenue stream and districts have to make a fast decision on what they're going to do, it's very difficult because you really only have to pick from in a short turnaround, books, supplies, services, or other outfit. There's not a lot of opportunities here unless you start talking about positions and that gets obviously very difficult very quickly and we don't want to do that. One other thing I wanted to mention on this slide is employee benefits. Um, some people may say, but wait, I didn't think Fremont Unified paid for benefits for its employees. And that's accurate. Starting in the mid-1990s and into the 2000s, the employee groups voted during their bargaining sessions to add the value of those benefits to their salary schedule. And the district, the agreement was the district stopped contributing towards the payment of health and welfare benefits. The benefits that are on this slide here are highlighting the mandated costs that the state has to pay for every employee to the state for unemployment insurance, things like that. It also includes pensions. And we're going to talk about pensions in a minute too. But the benefits here, again, these titles aren't our titles. These are the state titles. But benefits includes statutory costs, the things that districts and employers are all employers, not even just school districts, are required to pay. So for every dollar that is paid to an employee, there's a certain number of cents that have to go to the state in fees and taxes and things like that. One other thing I'll mention at the, the bottom of the screen, we wanted to have on here too, talking about investing in our employees over the last three year period, the, the collective three-year total of, of salary increases for our employees has been 17.47% plus a one-time payment. This, this isn't something to, to, to say, to just pass over quickly. This, this is an important thing. This is about retaining and attracting people to our district, the best people to our district. We've taken some other steps too, but 
this highlights, I think, a commitment by the district staff and by the board that they want to compensate people for doing, keep doing the job they've been doing. This is a critical thing, and we don't want to just skip over that. So those percentages and numbers are obviously included in all of the expenditures that are in the pie graph. Okay, a lot of numbers on this slide. So here's what we're trying to get across here. The revenue per student in Alameda County. So these are all the school districts in Alameda County, the public ones, and you can see where Fremont is ranking as far as total general fund revenues per student. Given the number of students that we have and the dollars that we get, we are ranked near the bottom, $13,339 per student, and that is below pretty much every other district in the county. Also on this slide, you can see that the local revenue per student is, I think, the lowest as well. It is $346 per student. And if you want to go one step farther, I think we're third or fourth lowest on the federal side. So the point is, federal, I'm sorry, uh, Fremont Unified funding per student levels are lower than our, our counterparts across the county. Some of these districts are small, some of them are big, but we all are in the same county and you can see how we compare to one another. There we go. A couple more things and then I'm going to turn this back over to Superintendent Kamek. The ending fund balance in our reserves. Um, the ending fund balance is something you may hear us talk about a lot, especially in board meetings. And this is the amount left over in each fund after all of our revenues have been collected and all of our expenses have been paid. Any remaining balance is one-time money. So the easy way to think about this might be to think about your personal financing, uh, your personal finances. You have all of your monthly expenses. You pay those monthly expenses with a, with a pay paycheck or a salary. And whatever you have left over, you get to hold on to. Maybe you put it in a savings account, maybe you leave it wherever you leave it, but once that money is spent, it's gone, it doesn't get replenished. The ending fund balance is very, very similar to that. And so there's an ending fund balance in every fund. So remember those 14 funds that I showed you? There's the transactions that we account for every single year, and then sometimes there's an ending fund balance in some of those funds. And that's okay, we can have ending fund balances. In some cases, like Fund 17, that's the, the state reserve that's required of us to hold on to. We can't really spend that. We're going to talk about that in just a second. Um, the Indian fund balance is made up of a lot of different things. There are funds in there that are restricted, like we've talked about. We can only um, spend them on certain things. There's committed funds. Those are funds that are earmarked by a decision by the local school board. There's unassigned funds. These are available to cover any expense. They're not, they're not uh, restricted or anything like that, and they haven't been earmarked. And as I mentioned, then there's reserves. These are the funds that are set aside to meet state law or school board rules. And in FUSD, that's fund 17. So I wanted to talk about that state law for the reserves. Uh, the state requires that a district over 30,000 students, which is how big we are, we have to hold on to 2% of our expenditures in reserve. And that amount is called the Reserve for Economic Uncertainty. Lots of acronyms, REU, what we say for short. Districts can decide to identify additional funds as a reserve if they so choose. And as I mentioned earlier, the FUSD board has a policy to hold an additional 1% of expenditures. And as we've mentioned, in, as of 2023, this is a, a new uh, thing from the last spring, the FUSD reserve for economic uncertainty are maintained in Fund 17. Why a specific fund for reserves? Fund 17 sets aside and isolates the amount of reserves that are established for only a reserve and not to be committed to another expense. So what would happen sometimes is that, remember I said that you have money left over and it would be at the bottom line? Well, one of the things in that bottom line was the state required reserve. And so people would look at it and say, oh, well, you've got this much money. And we'd say, yes, you do, but you can't spend X number of dollars of this because that's our state reserve. You can't, you can't spend this much. So we had a conversation among staff and talked to the board, and they agreed, and we moved those dollars and held them in Fund 17. It's the only thing in Fund 17. So now when you look at it, you can say, that's the state reserve and the local reserve. Great. We're not spending that. Then you turn your attention back to Fund 1, and you say, what's left? Don't have to do any math now. It's all done for you. Fund 1, if there's anything left there, and it's unassigned, like we talked about in the previous slide, that's where the board can make decisions about what they'd like to do. One thing I'd like to say about the reserve is um, it's 3% of um, our expenses, and our expenses are 480 to $500 million this year. So that only gets us about four to six weeks of payroll. It's like a month. 
of payroll. It's, this reserve is not going to bail us out in, in the case of the state uh, catastrophic economic downturn. And as soon as we use the reserve, by the next uh, budget cycle where we check in with the state and the county, we have to put that reserve back. So that next time frame, just to give you an idea, first interim ends this month in October. So if something happened and we had to grab our reserve now, we have to put it back almost within a couple of months. So it's state re requirement. We do set it aside. Um, I hope I'm never around to where we have to use it. That would be really, really catastrophic, and I don't think it'd be anything we do locally. It's probably be something that, that the state at the state's level. But just wanted to talk about 3% gets us to about a month, maybe six weeks. So the current ending fund balance in the current budget year, wanted to just uh, reference this. We have uh, um, several commitments that, we, that the board made and approved back in uh, June when they adopted the budget. We have set aside about $3 million for emergency supplies. We saw a need across all of our school districts, to, or all of our schools, pardon me, to um, update the emergency supplies that are there, like the, the food and water supplies and gloves and masks, all the things that, that need to be regularly turned over. Um, LCAP carryover, so we talked about the local control accountability plan. There was some carryover money um, from last year, and we get to earmark that so that it can be spent by our, our folks who oversee the LCAP and instructional services. We wanted to hold that money. So this is that supplemental dollars we talked about. So we had a little bit left over. We're setting it aside, and they can continue to spend it to support our students. Uh, replace transportation vehicles, about $4 million we set aside for that, and then $6 million for textbook adoption over several years. All of these are to be done over several years. These are not one-year set-asides to all be spent in, in one year. That's not the purpose. Other assignments that are in the ending fund balance in, in Fund 1, there's um, schools facility use funds. So these are the funds that get collected when we rent our facilities out, and these get returned back to school sites. Uh, Medi-Cal allocation of 543000 Technology refresh of $8.4 million. And these dollars are, again, just like the ones up above under commitments, to be used over several years, not all at once, so that we can replenish our devices as they are in need of re replacement. And then the last thing here is called deficit spending. Currently, if you look at our accounting books in Fund 1, you'll see very clearly we are spending more dollars than we bring in in a single year in revenue. And so what we did in the um, business department is we calculated and we'll recalculate it again. They're in the process of doing that now for our report in December, how much money we need to have set aside to basically cover the gap of our overspend. It's called deficit spending. And we set it aside so that we can guarantee whatever we're doing right now, level of service wise, we can continue that for a couple of years. But just like your savings account, once these dollars are spent, they're gone. So we've got enough money set aside that we can do exactly what we're doing right now for a couple more years. And we're gonna have to have some conversations and decide what will happen when that time comes. And we'll have those conversations as early as possible because you don't wanna to wait to the last minute. But it's important to identify if you're overspending, how much you're overspending by so that you can make a plan to have a balanced budget at some point in the near future. That's the point of this item called deficit spending. And at this point, I'm going to turn it back over to Superintendent Kamek, who's going to talk about unfunded and underfunded mandates. Thanks, Mr. Hillman. So I'm going to go over a bunch of the motivating good news for everybody. Um, a couple of things just to point out on some of the slides that we just went through. Uh, Mr. Hillman talked about uh, community-funded districts. Sometimes that's referred to as a basic aid district. And one question that I get a lot is, why don't we choose to be a basic aid district? And I just want to clarify that that's not a choice any local district gets to make. It's, surely a, it's merely a calculation of the property tax revenue received locally, and the state determines that for you. So it's not something that a district can say, we would like to be a basic aid district moving forward. Districts don't have any say in, in that matter. Another piece that I'd like to just point out as a, as a point of reference, and Mr. Hillman or uh, Director Akal in the back might be able to correct the number if I'm off a little bit. But we talked about the need to recruit and retain staff in Fremont Unified. And there's, in my opinion, no argument that our staff across the district is deserving of substantial pay increases to honor the work that they do for our students. But how do we put that in a context? And right now, I think the cost of a 1% salary increase, so if we agree to increase everybody's salary in the district by 1%, it would cost us roughly $3.75 million of ongoing money because it's an ongoing raise. So we pay that 
year over year. So when you saw the slide with uh, set asides and reserves, and you see you know three million dollars set aside for something, um, and it's got a line item attached to it, those are one-time dollars. But oftentimes when we talk about pay increases, we lose percent of what we call the cost of one percent. And it's a significant number to keep track of because when you see some of these slides coming up, that goes really into the competing interest of how do we manage all of our operations with limited and fixed resources from the state and costs that are a little bit beyond our control for some goods and services and pensions and honor the work of our great employees and recruit and retain the best employees for our students. So some of the things that come to us as challenges we talked about how important enrollment is. Your left side of the screen, my right, is something that I can't really help with, and that's declining birth rates, but it significantly impacts school districts across the state. And so you see the graph on your right, my left, across the entire state of California, you'll see that every county except for maybe one is declining in enrollment. And if you're following the state population as a whole, you know that in the last few years has been the first time that I can ever recall that the state of California has actually gone down in population. So the decline in birth rates across the state and across the nation for that matter, and the fact that we see people moving out of California, both of those contribute to declining enrollment in almost every district in the state. In the Bay Area, almost every district is in declining enrollment except for just a, a small handful. Um, when you look at birth rates, it's something that we track very closely because we look at our local birth rates and then we measure out for four and a half years now with transitional kindergarten to get an estimate of how many students we might see incoming into our school district in that time period. So our enrollment this year, we predicted that we'd be going down about 400 to 450 students in our budgeting uh, because that's the trend that we've been starting to see. We actually had a great revert, not complete reversal, but a real significant <coughs> slowdown in that trend. And you can see on this slide, we projected an enrollment of 32,288 students. Our actual enrollment is 32,655. So we're seeing an increase of over 360 students, which is fantastic. You see that biggest increase manifesting in our elementary schools. That may have to do with the fact that we were able to finally move to extended day um, kindergarten as opposed to the half day program. This is helpful for us because as we get funding from the state, we have the option to use a three year rolling average of our enrollment. And so when our last three years were going down, this year we'll offset that a little bit. And hopefully this trend will continue where we can stay close to flat enrollment and maybe even go back up. Because every year that you lose enrollment, you're losing revenue. So a big aspect that I talked about with the competing interests is pensions. And there's no competing interest in the fact that we want our employees to have the pensions and they're set forward by the state. So most people that are working are paying into Social Security. But in a school district, a public school district, your employees in this district are all paying into CalPERS or CalSTRS. In most cases, CalPERS are employees that are not credentialed, are classified employees. CalSTRS are individuals who have a credential. And with that, that includes contributions from the school district and contributions from the, empl uh, the employee themselves. So way back when, when I started teaching in fifth grade, eight and a quarter percent of my paycheck went to my pension. And every time that happened out of one of my paychecks, my employer, at that time it was Mount Diablo Unified, and it was a, a, a rate across the whole state, matched that eight and a quarter percent. Well, the complexity and the issue here with contributions towards pensions is that Fremont Unified doesn't have any control over what we contribute. And we're gonna look at that on this slide. So you can see, here that it's been a relatively flat rate for quite a while. And then you can see in uh, around 1415, there you go, the state passed a new law which changed those percentages. And so the STRS rates, the Cal STRS rates are set by the legislature. 
the CalPERS rates are set by a body that is half elected, half appointed. None of those have influence from Fremont Unified School District. We have no say about the contribution towards pensions. And what you can see here is the dramatic increase that used to be around eight and a quarter percent. And you can see how high it's gone and where it's projected to go. So that means when we get new revenue from the state of California, we have to take that new revenue and set aside this money before we even start talking about anything else. And I'm gonna give you a spoiler here. The state never said, oh, we passed the new law that's gonna raise these rates. Here's some new money to help cover that. They absolutely did not. And so what does it mean in dollars for us locally in Fremont Unified? Well, you can take a look at the chart here in front of you, but you can see from CalSTRS to CalPERS where we were in 2016-17. And you can see where we are this year. So the net change between roughly $31.5 million towards contributions towards now $80 million in contributions what could we have done with the 40 plus million dollars that makes up that gap for students for programs for schools for facilities but instead as the slide says in my opinion and i'm very critical of the state in this regard they're passing the buck and they're burdening school districts and frankly our students with the unfunded pension liability that exists within the state now i'm a member of the same Sturge group or Purge group and I would like my pension to be there when I can no longer work and I want all of our employees to have that pension that they've worked so hard for that they have contributed to but I do think it's unfair for the state to pass this on to school districts and in fairness the state has also passed it on in some ways to the employees because their rates have gone up from contributing eight and a quarter percent to I want to say it's roughly up to eight, 11 and a half percent or 12 percent for some employees now. So not only have districts had to pay more towards it, employees have as well. And one can argue that, well, that makes sense because employees, myself included, are paying it toward a pension which they will then receive in the future. Yes, but it doesn't make the difficulty of managing, recruiting and retaining staff and dealing with limited resources any easier. And so I think this slide is really important because people often ask me, what would you fix to fix school funding? This is one of the things that I would fix because I can think of a lot that we could do with an extra 40 plus million dollars for our students and our facilities and our community. The other thing that I would fix, since you asked, <laughs> is special education funding. And this is very near and dear to my heart, so I want to make very clear that I fundamentally believe in my core that we have every obligation morally and ethically to serve all students. That includes our special education students who have some of the highest needs. That is something that we are going to continue to do in Fremont Unified and I believe most districts do it very well. I think we do it better than many other districts though. That being said, IDEA, Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, was passed at the federal level. And with that legislation came a promise from the federal government. And that promise was to fund 40% of special education costs. I'm in my 20 plus years of service in public education. In my time, I have never seen it exceed 15%, ever. And so that's the second thing I would fix. It's a broken promise from the federal government, and it's the law set by the federal government, and they don't hold their promise for the funding. So what does that actually mean dollars-wise for Fremont Unified? And some of you have seen this slide before. It means at the federal level, this is 21-22, this is 22-23. We're just going to look at the 22-23 school year. In total, $95 million here. How much of that comes from the federal government? 8.7%. Now we're grateful that the state helps us out. As Mr. Hillman mentioned, 
we do get restricted funding for special education from the state. And as Mr. Hillman mentioned, we make a contribution from our general fund of nearly $53 million. And as I said in the beginning of these remarks, that's something that I want to do for our students who need those services. But when you think about the financial difference it could have on a school district, if the federal government covered 40% of the costs as they have promised to do, you can only imagine what we could do with that additional money year over year in terms of supporting students, designing program. It's uh, just off the cuff, probably 100 to 150 employees that we could that we could bring on board, right? And so those are the two things that I think are the underfunded and unfunded mandates that come from the state that have the, dram the most dramatic impact on school funding, not only in Fremont Unified, but across the entire state. And when you couple that with what you saw in an earlier graph related to the local control funding formula, which has a great core principle of establishing, establishing an allocation of dollars where students might have higher need, but it creates a situation where the playing field is very unlevel. And it creates challenges for each individual, each individual district in the state to try and advocate for a larger piece of the pie at the state level. And as Mr. Hillman mentioned, as I'm sure you recall in preparation for the quiz, 40% of the state budget coming to schools doesn't seem like a lot, but it is. It's probably the biggest chunk that gets taken out of the state budget. But I'm still fighting for more and I appreciate our board support. We've gone to the federal level, to Washington, D.C. the last two years to continue to advocate for changes in special education funding. But those are the areas that really impact what we're able to do with the resources we receive. And I wanna just highlight that with one more example or some more context. When you think about the amount that goes to the CalPERS, CalSTRS contributions from what's changed in 2016, and then you take the general fund contribution that we make because the federal government doesn't hold their promise. If you just take those two amounts of money, you can see what a different fiscal condition we might have absent those issues. So how do we get protected funding based on a promise? And that's through community funding. And Mr. Hillman talked a little bit, a little bit about that in the beginning of his remarks. And so we're going to go over a little bit of our local funding now from our Fremont community. The reason I say it's protected is because it's agreed upon when voters pass a ballot measure, how much will be contributed, and we make a promise to the voters on what that money will be allocated towards. So in Fremont Unified, we have a tax rate just for our bond, for example, again, making some comparison to other districts in the county. So this is based on a per $100,000 assessed valuation of your property. So for every $100,000 of assessed value in your property, Fremont voters are paying just under $50. You can see where other districts fall in the category across the county. And these are based on local measures. And again, this is specific to bonds. We also have Measure I, which is a parcel tax. It generates about $4.5 million for us annually. You can see on the screen what it helps us provide for our students and our schools and our staff. And Measure I is set to expire in June of 2025. Very important support from our community that helps us provide some incredible services and programs for our students. In terms of Measure E, which I mentioned, we did pass a $650 million general obligation bond. Um, as you saw on the previous slide, the things outlined in Measure I are promises made to the voters in the ballot initiative. In Measure E, in the same way, the general obligation bonds are specific to facility enhancements. So infrastructure and facility enhancements. You can see just some of the pictures of what we've worked on with Measure E. There are far more projects than be, can be captured in this slide. And when we sell our bonds, which is what generates the money for the projects, we sell them in series. We don't sell them all at once because there are rules about how much revenue you can have from a bond sale on hand at once. So we match the timing of selling the bonds with the amount that we're committed to construction projects. And so we just sold our last series of the Measure E bonds in 2022. 
and we work very hard for our voters. We have a AA2 credit rating, and that allows us to have competitive rates when we go to market. Also, whenever there's an opportunity like you might if you are owning a home with your mortgage, if the, if the finance rates get better, you might refinance your property. Well, we have that opportunity sometimes with our bonds, and when we see that, our financial advisors that we work with advise us to try and refinance some of these bonds. I think we've done that two or three times since I started in Fremont Unified, and when we do that, we're saving our taxpayers millions of dollars, so it's something we pay attention to as well, because that means our total payback of the bond is less as a community. So we have current needs and future growth. Um, when we did measure E, we started with a long-range facilities plan that identified $1.6 billion in facilities needs. Now that was back in 2014. So I'm just going to go ahead and say that we're just about in 2024. So 10 years later, we've done a lot of great projects. But where we weren't working on projects, those needs have increased. So we're in the process of updating our long-range facilities plan with current needs and assessments at each site and the estimated cost for those identified uh, projects. As you may have seen, because I know you all check your district mail from, uh, from your school and the district regularly, and I know you read every word of what we send, <coughs> but as you may have seen, we're, in, we're doing some community engagement to get more input from our community related to how they feel about the services that we provide and the facilities that we have. And in that effort, we're hearing a lot of great feedback, and that will help the board and our staff think about what comes next. We are already engaged in polling. We've gotten some initial polling back on a future uh, bond measure and a future parcel tax measure. When we do that polling, we work with a researcher who goes out and takes a sample of our voting population, which is different than uh, our parent population because not everybody in Fremont has kids in our schools, but we get the cross section of our community and they engage in questions. You might hang up on some of those calls. You might take some of those calls. But they give us that helpful feedback to see where our community is feeling about a future measure for a parcel tax and or a facilities bond. So that's going to end our presentation tonight. We're a few minutes early. And because the theater is really crowded, we're going to do this slowly. But we will take a few questions if they're on hand. But while you're thinking of questions, what I'd like you to do if you have a phone is try and take a picture of this QR code. And if your picture doesn't work, you can enter the address that's on the screen for you. And for those who may be watching live on the feed, you can try to take a picture of the QR code through the feed. And if that doesn't work for you, you can put in the web address that's listed on the screen. And it's going to take you to a thought exchange. And what I would encourage you to do, I would wait a few minutes for questions is to engage with that online format. It's going to ask you a question, and you're going to be able to input your response. And your name's not going to be associated with it. It's going to be anonymous. And after you input your response, it will take you to the next screen, where you will see other people's responses. And you can rate the things that resonate with you with, let's say, five stars. Or if there's things that don't really resonate with you, you don't have to give them five stars. But what that does as we go through this evening and Wednesday night's presentation. The thought exchange will be open through the uh, end of the day on Sunday. And we'll get a lot of good community input on things that were presented tonight, things that are important to the community, and then our staff will be able to generate some constructive action steps from that feedback. So please take the time to do that. It'll take you just a few minutes, maybe before you leave today. Um, I'd say maybe when you get home, but if your home's anything like mine, all bets are off once you get there. Uh, but this will be posted online. If you want to come back to it, we'll make sure that there's a link to the Thought Exchange. Uh, before we take questions, I want to thank the people who joined us on the live stream. I want to thank the people who came in person. And again, I want to acknowledge and thank the staff that helped put this on, Washington High School and uh, Mr. Hillman, Laura Forrest, our Public Information Officer, and again, Luis Samora in the back who's handling some of the production. Uh, we will take a few questions if there are any. I don't have another mic, but if you say the question, I'll repeat it so the streaming audience can hear it. Yes? I have a question on, on slide 36. If the unfunded mandate for the special education was increased to the 40%, is there any, would the state take away any part of their 35% that they also contribute? 
true. I mean, I'm just wondering if, if they're making it up through the state. Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, I don't know the answer to that. I, I think it's possible. Um, we, we could see an increase from the state and the, uh, from the federal government and a decrease from the state. I would hope that we wouldn't. Um, there's a few examples recently that aren't a direct connection, but that I might point to, which is uh, the governor and the legislature were really uh, firm about if the federal government decreased funding for meals for all kids, that the state would pick that up. And so it's not a direct tie-in, but I do also think there would, if the federal government finally lived up to their promise, I can see a lot of people being really, really upset with their elected officials at the state level if the state all of a sudden thought that was a reason for them to back off their level of funding. Yeah, no, I agree. I was just curious. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes, Trustee Jones. Yes, I know um, from this year compared to the prior year, we saw an increase in our ending fund balance. And I'm wondering how that, why, why that occurred, if that is typical of other districts in the state and about how we, we compare. And again, whether or not those funds were restricted or unrestricted. Yeah, I'll give you an overview answer to that. And uh, I apologize, I don't know if I repeated the first question, but the first question was about if we got more federal funding from the state or from the government for special ed if the state would decrease that. This question is, you know, we had a higher ending fund balance than we anticipated this year, and what is the cause of that, and how does that compare to other districts? So we did have a higher fund balance uh, than normal. In comparison to other districts, we do see districts having a higher fund balance than expected right now, in part because of the significant amount of one-time monies. In addition, uh, staffing is, is dynamic for many districts right now because of enrollment and so some of our ending fund balance is because we didn't need all the staffing that we budgeted and so that instead of spending those dollars that we set aside for staffing it, it went to the bottom line other components of the ending fund balance maybe uh, those would be the two big ones and so we try and be pretty close um, but i don't think we're that far off compared to other districts and certainly a little bit different than the ending fund balance, but that's a place where we rather obviously have a higher than anticipated ending fund balance. One of the things that districts get into the most trouble with is when they over project their enrollment and under project their expenses. Um, so we over projected our expenses a little bit, but I don't think we're that far off compared to other districts in terms of a percentage of the ending fund balance. Because we're the 23rd largest district in the state, our numbers are always going to be bigger, but percentage-wise, I don't think we're too far off. Yes? Um, for the bond tax rate, Alameda County, oh, sorry, Fremont's quite low. Is that because that's all we asked for or all we're able to ask for? I, I just didn't understand. Yeah, the bond tax rate is, is just what our current tax levy is for general obligation bonds. So if we historically have passed more bonds, uh, for example, there are some districts that have um, every district, and Mr. Hill might be able to explain this a little bit in greater detail, but every district has a certain amount of bonding capacity based on the assessed valuation of their community. And so that bonding capacity does set a ceiling on certain things, but how many bonds you sell over time and how quickly they're paid off is really what contributes to that total tax levy related to a general obligation bond. Um, so this isn't our ceiling, it's just where we're currently at? That's correct. And relative to other districts in the county or the Bay Area, when you combine our bond and our parcel tax, we're still relatively low in terms of the levy that's, that's put on the tax bill. Yes? I have a question about um, the UPP. Mr. Hillman mentioned that one of the indicators to receive it is students qualify for free or reduced lunch. Now that lunch is free to all students, does that impact that funding? Great question. So it's not impacting the funding in terms of the state allocation, but it is something that districts are seeing as a challenge because before when meals were not free for all students, families were a little bit more engaged in making sure that the paperwork was filled out and that is what 
assured the qualification for a free or reduced meal price. And right now, districts are working hard across the state to engage their families to say, can you still give us this information? And families aren't always wanting to uh, disclose a level of income, and we understand the sensitivity of that. But what it does impact is if we don't have that information disclosed, it can impact our local percentage that we're able to report to the state. So our UPP percentage is about 27%. We've seen it go up a little bit the last few years, but that's where we may see an impact, is the money is still going to be allocated from the state, but it has become a little more challenging for school districts to identify the families that would qualify for free and reduced lunch when they now know that all students are going to receive a meal at no cost. Great question. Well, I want to thank you again for coming. Thank you to those who Zoomed in. I've kept you six minutes past the, the instructional bell. So thank you very much, and uh, look forward to seeing a new group on Wednesday night. Have a great ride home.